So, ethics in video games. I'm not sure what you guys expect here. So, basically, we've got a small panel of academics, uh, shit talkers, and ne'er do wells in varying degrees of uh, quality. <laughs> We're going to discuss the ethics of video games, but also games in general. And ethics means a lot of different things. Now, before we begin, I think our panelists should all introduce themselves because they've all got pretty interesting projects going on and things in their own lives, except for us, of course. That's right. We'll start with the left because you just started to take a drink. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Benjamin. Uh, I'm finishing up my master's degree right now at Georgetown University in Communication, Culture, and Technology. Um, my main project is kind of uh, video game anthropology, sociology. I look at um, the closure of massively multiplayer online games and what happens to the players and communities uh, when they're shut down. Um, and so um, I'm going to probably end up talking a little bit about research ethics because um, I've had a lot of trouble getting over those hurdles. Uh, <laughs> but I'm sure I'll have plenty to say about some of the other stuff that we're going to be talking about, too. All right. So I'm Rim. I'm one of the hosts of Geek Nights, a podcast about nerdery and geekery. And I also work for a financial software company where I design software to sort of model and manage stock and option and future transactions and things like that. And I'm at pretty much every nerd convention like this doing things like this. Yep. Uh, I'm the other host of the Geek Nights podcast. I'm Scott. Uh, I'm also at a zillion conventions. And I actually don't have any professional nerd credentials, but I have a huge mountain of non-professional nerd credentials. <laughs> so it's enough to get on this panel. I'm uh, Chris Hazard. I run Hazard Software. Some of you may know that from the game Akron, the, the made of time strategy game, the, the time travel RTS. Uh, we also do mostly serious games, so games for strategy, games for the military, the intelligence community, business, things like that. So most of that, that work I can't talk a whole lot about, but I've done a lot of work with uh, game balancing and game mechanics. I also hold a PhD in computer science from North Carolina State University, and it was on the uh, mathematics of trust and reputation, how you build an artificial intelligence around that. So sometimes I, I say that I'm a rational agent psychologist. <laughs> so... We're not going to talk about this because I think the ethical implications of Ender's Game are actually pretty obvious, but I worry, how many of you know what Ender's Game is about? I told you. They Only about half. half. Every one of you should read it. We're going to try not to spoil it too much, but we're going to spoil at least one of the main points of this book along the way. We'll get back to Ender's Depending Game. Depending how much time we have. So, more importantly, why are we having this discussion? Why are games different? Why... Are, why do people talk, want to talk about the ethics of gaming or video games separately from all the other media that humans have created for the last 40,000 years? So I think one thing is that the, uh, video games push you more to be in the role of the player that, you're, that you are. As, you know, if you're reading a book, you think, oh, I'm being this player, but really you're, you're following along the constraints of someone else. If you're watching a movie, if you're, um, you, you think, oh, I like this character because this character behaves in a particular way, and I don't have the freedom to do whatever I want. It's a smaller set of choices, but really we're not making any choices. So this, this character is, is mean to certain people, does certain things. It, you know, think of uh, like Tony Soprano or Dexter, Dexter or some of the HBO uh, recent classics where you have these very strongly typed characters, and people fall in love with those characters because they, uh, they <coughs> behave in so specific ways. Video games a lot of times you have much more flexibility. Any game that you can choose to be good or evil and walk, walk down these different paths, or you actually have to do the actions as opposed to watch them. So what's the difference between, for example, a novel and a choose-your-own-adventure novel? I mean, you're making decisions then choose-your-own-adventure, but is it really any different on a fundamental level than simply choosing to skip a chapter where something you don't like happening happened in a book? Well, I think, you know, when you have a choose-your-own-adventure, right, even though there's choices, every choice has already been completely scripted, right? You can't, I mean, you can modify it, but that's just, that's writing, right? Well, but you can make the same argument about video games. Well, because it, depends on, the, it depends on the video game, right? Some video games are basically effectively equal to a choose-your-own-adventure book, right? Yeah. So for maybe Fallout would be along those lines, right? But some other video games, maybe Dwarf Fortress, Right, you know, you can do all sorts of crazy things that were, were never scripted. Before. But is Dwarf Fortress not still beholden to the fact that we may or may not have an actual random number generator? It might be pre-scripted regardless. You could run Dwarf Fortress with a hardware random number generator and a piece of cesium and see what happens. Well, then we have to argue about whether or not there's determinism in the universe. But I think we got into that. <laughs> now, along those lines, uh, show of hands, how many people here who, uh, who've read Choose Your Own Adventure books have uh, looked read ahead and stuck your finger in this page and stuck your finger in this page? And yeah, everybody, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, anybody who did not? Wow. You just read it okay. straight through? 
<laughs> liars. Liars you got all to, you. The first ending you got to, you put the book away. I'll admit that I would often, I'd see two options. It's like, go over the rickety bridge that's surely to kill you, or stay safe at home. I'd always read the rickety one to see what sort of gruesome death I'd get, and then I'd back off into the real adventure. And that's, that's a way of pathfinding. It's a heuristic. You think that the story's going to dead end shortly there, so you can traverse the entire tree of the story very quickly. And anybody who's played games and tried to be a completionist, as I have before, um, you try to find a way to find everything in the game, and that's a very quick way of doing it. So it sounds like one of the differences with the games is simply that we're actually going through the motions in some capacity, even if it's something so simple as putting a dot down on a piece of paper, than if we're actually just reading something that's completely written by someone else. So we could argue that games are effectively mind control then, could we not? And uh, we have an example of this. I think, I think you jumped a little further in your logic, but I mean... So are games mind control? Is there, at what point are you controlled by the designer of a game? There's some theory around this, but do, do you have any opinions on it? I mean, has a game ever caused you to do something that you didn't want to do? Like stay up until four in the morning playing Civ 2 when you're at school the next day? Uh, there, there have maybe been a couple times when I've uh, gotten stuck uh, in front of whatever it was that I was doing. Um, I don't know if I would really blame that on the game and call it mind control. I mean, you could, but that really makes it seem, I think, more sinister than it is. I think it's really the factor of... Um, you know, the immersion level. You know, that when we're playing video games, you're really uh, jumping into a completely different mindset and, and place. And you're making decisions in a different way than, than you do in the real world, partly because of the way that, um, you know, and I think it's mitigated, but uh, the way that your con consequences in, when you're playing video games are, have, are very different than when you're making real life decisions. And I think that, that has a huge effect on, on, you know, as we play through things like that. I, I think it has a more profound effect, especially when integrated with social media. Take any Facebook game, for example. Now you become the propagator of a meme, but there's another, uh, trans there's another side transmission to propagate that meme. So a meme is you know, an idea that carries on from one person to another um, that exists on its own, and sometimes it grows, sometimes it dies. Well, a, a Facebook game, now you're, they're trying to get you to play the game, but also advertise it to all of your friends. So the game is using you as a medium to spread itself. So does that bother anyone? Like, show of hands, does it bother you if a game is advertising through you, even if you're enjoying yourself? It's about fit. I'm very hesitant, though. No but one was very much I, like... like <laughs> well, I feel like we're assigning a lot of agency to games. Like, we're saying the games are advertising that... The games are not doing these things. Developers are using the game as a tool to accomplish right, these goals. Right, and that's... I right, think so ethics that's, fundamentally has to do with the actions and, and the, it effect, its effects on other people and, you know, and, and right, people so the, in general. The question is about the ethics of the developer, right? It's not, is the game wrong? It's, is it, was it wrong for the developer to make that game? You know, was it unethical to make that game in the first place? Was it unethical to sell that game? Was it unethical to tell people to play that game? So I guess that would come down to, like, we talk about addiction. I mean, <laughs> people can get addicted to all sorts of things, and video game addiction is a huge topic in the media lately. So at what point is an addiction or some sort of compulsion to play video games any different from a compulsion for, say, a physical substance or some sort of physical pleasure or something that we traditionally consider to be a disease or an illness? Is there a difference with video games? Well, I mean, medically, there's talk about, you know, like, you know, this, you know, dopamine or serotonin. I always forget all the different friggin' brain The chemicals. serotonin addiction Right, thing? yeah. You know, it's like you play video games. When you do certain things in video games, chemicals are released in your brain in some amount, right? So it's, there is some sort of chemical thing that I'm not an expert on going on. So... And I think this is a good way to jump into... I think you showed me a few slides last night ahead of this. I think we should go over those first. <laughs> all right, so suppose... We could, we, we understand the behavior of addiction, and basically if you control the uh, incentives you give someone in a game, and you control the punishments and the rewards and everything all in a certain way, you can basically guarantee that on average people will be much more engaged and play the game much more often than they would otherwise. There's, there's science behind this. Is it any different ethically if, say, I'm designing a game with all of you, and we design it and design it, and we play test it, and when we start playing it more, we decide that it's a better game? And eventually the game becomes super addictive and matches that chart solely because we've designed it for ourselves to be addictive because we assume if we're playing it more, the game is better. Versus if a marketing person goes to the game designers and says, use this chart to make an addictive game that we're going to sell. Is there any ethical difference between those two scenarios? I mean, you're making the same game either way, right? So, you know, you could argue that... Well, if, you know, if making that game is unethical, does it matter why, how you came across you know, the design for that game? If you, you, know, you, you still design the same game and put it out. I mean, this is the question of if I'm you know, uh, breaking into the pharmacy to steal medicine, does it matter if it's for my grandmother who's dying or if it's for me? You know, breaking into the pharmacy, does that change? Is, does the reason I, why I did it change the, 
Uh, the do the ends justify the means? I mean, and, and but this is but this is the opposite actually. This is this is the same ends with different means. You're talking about two different means with the same ends. Well, they're the same mean, but a different same motivation. Same means, different true. right? It's the it's the so opposite. we're even one further like meta out on this. Right? Yeah, yeah. And just like every other ethics uh, discussion, we'll not con- arrive to any conclusions. Uh, <laughs> At yes, text please, Des- please expect no so- uh, solid answers from us. Right? Today. Does everyone understand this chart? Basically, so what what this is talking about is like let's say you're playing a video game, right? And we, you know, some, you know, you level up maybe once every half hour, right? Well, that's a fixed interval, right? So you can see, right, the cum- the number of responses in your brain with a fixed interval. Right? Number of interactions, like a rat who hits a lever and gets a food. He'll keep hitting the lever more and more and more with that red line than with that uh, pink line at the bottom. Right, no. so it's basically, if you, you can set up the button, you know, the button gives out food once a minute. Well, the rat's going to hit the button once a minute. But if you make it so that pushing the button, food comes out, maybe, it's random whether food will come out, the rat will hit the button like crazy, like a slot machine. Now, there's more to it than that. Uh, they've done some work with, with some uh, pigeons, I believe. Yeah, pigeons. Yeah. And they were, uh, you know, they pressed the button, and the button was completely disconnected from whether or not food came out. And the pigeon sometimes would say, oh, well, I, had, I stepped on it with my right foot. So then it would start stepping on with its right foot and assume that it was, it was doing confirmation bias with itself. And by the end of this experiment, the pigeons were doing these very complicated dances every <laughs> single time the same way. And this is the same way that the superstitions are built. Now, another interesting research that came out, I think in the last year or two, um, especially it relates to game, gaming a little bit indirectly, is that people who are depressed tend to be much better at assessing probability. Because people who are not depressed tend to uh, assume that all this confirmation bias, oh, I, you know, I'm doing well, I have good luck, or oh, this, this worked. Depressed people are actually closer to uh, closer to re- the probability of reality, which shows that reality sex. So it's what, true. Yeah. We're so, really bad at probability. So well, you'll win ethical, games if you realize reality sex. Would it be ethical from a research standpoint? Say you're you're using games to harvest information about players to study players. What if your MMO that you've released is still gathering this data after the fact, and you discover that a subset of your players, based on all the evidence you've gathered, are probably clinically depressed? Like, you have pretty solid evidence that they, these players are clinically depressed. Do you have an ethical obligation to do something Jeez. about that? Um, I don't know. That, that's, uh, I don't know if I had necessarily... Mm. It would depend on if it was my fault, right? Is it my game that made them different? <laughs> um, there, is, there was an instance where I do know, you know, on the subject of, you know, this kind of stuff, um, there was a guy, uh, Ed Castronova, who was doing some economics work. Um, and so he had two servers um, that, you know, his grad students were running for him or whatever, recruited people to play on them. And it was like the only difference between them was, the, like, the price of a health potion. Um, and about a few weeks into this, this thing, one of his grad students noticed that they had screwed something up. And was like, okay, that's okay. We'll just pull the plug and reset everything. And and uh, Ed was just like, was just like, well, wait a minute. You you can't do that because all these people have already invested all of this time and stuff into it. And if you do that, that's going to have a huge effect on them. Um, and in the end, you'll need new people to study on. Well, not only because... new people. He was afraid that that it was not ethical to just take it all away from people uh, suddenly like that without any warning. Um, and so he ended up keeping those games running and starting a whole different. Uh, wow. Experiment. So, like, if we'd given ev- so if we'd given everyone out there World yeah. of Warcraft, it never existed in the world. You played it for a month, and we took it away. We're done with the experiment. Yeah. That actually gives me, you know, going back one step, it gives me another thought. Like, if you could look at your player data and determine people were depressed, right? Well, suddenly you've got player account data, and now you've discovered, you know, something that's supposed to be private medical information, and you've you've connected it, even though no one gave that to you, like from a doctor's office. So well, this is one of the, yeah. right, this is one of the terrifying things. Not terrifying. This is one of the kind of scary things about today's you know information economy. Right? We get we gather all this information. The amount of information that's being gathered about you while you're playing something like World of Warcraft. That information can be mined if, for incredible things like finding out which of your players are depressed. And I would guess that those things would probably correlate if you could ever get your hands on that data, um, which you never could. Well, there have been a bunch of studies I've seen around this. Where well, you say never could, but everyone's security <laughs> seems to be pretty awful these days, right? So. Well, it's more, it's such like weird fiddly, you'd need access to a full set of data instead of like just user accounts. Yeah, yeah. You'd need like player behavior ratios and it might not all be tracked. It could be difficult. Someone actually, this morning I saw someone put up CSV files of every play in the NFL from 2002 through 2012 in a CSV. And I'm like, oh my God. So (coughs) we'll we'll jump back to this research topic because we we can talk about a little more when we talk about violence and sort of the the typical things people talk about in terms of video game design. Actually, I've got a good segue from that. Uh, So there was another paper that came out of Case Western this year that was looking at uh, the fMRI, what parts of your brain are active when you're doing things that require uh, like puzzle-solving skills, like like 
solving a problem, versus social skills, being, being emotional, knowing what other people's emotional states are, being empathetic. And they found that the, the two regions in the brain that control each of those are mutually exclusive. So if one is highly activated, it actually deactivates the other one. And they cannot both be active at the same time. So now, looking at games with, with this reinforcement, if you're reinforcing players to feel more social, you'll, you'll worsen their, their, temp, their ability to solve problems just at that, at that given moment. Or if you're having them solve problems and work through puzzles, now you can have them shoot babies in the head or something like that <laughs> that um, they otherwise may not do. And you can use that and, and engineer that kind of behavior. I wonder how that works for social problem-solving games. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, you know, if you think about um, when somebody, oh, a baby, goo goo gaga, and then they, they sort of get dumb, it's, it reinforces that idea. Well, I mean, if you notice, right, games, you know, you don't often see a, a game that becomes popular that has complex puzzles and social elements, right? There might be, you know, a social game, but the puzzles are always, you know, when the game is more social, the, the puzzles always seem to be way easier, right? You never see, you know, you, know, you see something maybe like Tetris or Bejeweled, you're not going to see Magical Drop or, uh, you know, Money Changing Idol, you know, with social elements. Yeah. I was about to say, there, even there, was a, there was a Myst MMO for a little while, um, and that was that was had a lot of problems all the elements. Although admittedly, it really didn't last very. It never got off the ground. Although it was mostly yeah. a technical. That's what I'm saying. You know, I'm saying people have tried, right? And I'm saying these games. Every game, almost every game exists nowadays. You know, some example, but I'm saying successful people play it a lot. No, taking it to the extreme. This very has echoes of the old the Milgram experiment, which is a very famous experiment. I don't know how many of you out there are familiar with it. We got about the same people are raising their hands being familiar with everything. I think. <laughs> Congratulations. Everyone, anyone Everyone else their is hand? sleeping still. <laughs> That's going to be. Anyway. Basically, you, so as Dr. Hazard was kind of alluding to, you could make a game that would sort of desensitize someone to a certain action, and maybe you release this game the day before an election. At what point is there an ethical consideration if you're trying to manipulate the masses? But then again, is the gaming stuff any different from a different kind of media that does the same thing through some totally different psychological mechanism? If these were easy questions, we wouldn't have this panel. If we were all just like, yep, 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 yep. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about, yeah, okay, so who knows about the Kampu gacha? Anybody? One guy knows about two people. Okay, so here's the deal. Uh, <coughs> you know what a gacha pawn is? It's basically, you know, you put a quarter in, you turn the crank, and a toy comes out, right? It's a J Japanese thing. So Kampu gacha is basically this game mechanic. Uh, you've seen it before. You've seen it here in McDonald's Monopoly, right? You randomly get something. Right? And then you're trying to build the full set of things to get the grand prize, right? So you put in a coin, you get, you know, the sword, yes. And now I get the helmet, yes, I'm only, I'm halfway there. And another sword. And another helmet. That sounds like a variable reinforcement and schedule. And another sword. <laughs> oh, ooh, the gun, I only need the shield now. The shield is so rare. It's like boardwalk, right? You're not going to get the shield, right? <laughs> you just get swords, guns, and helmets all over the place, right? So when you build a game with this mechanic, it turns out that people just keep turning the crank over and over again to keep getting more and more things, right? And in Japan, there were problems with this uh, because basically... You know, people would, you know, kids would get, like, you know, uh, an iPhone from their parents, and they would find a game like this. It was, like, there was an aquarium one, I think, where kids just, like, they start buying food like crazy. So Japan just said, yeah, you can't do no compu gacha. It's not allowed, period. Now, th that's part of why we started using this panel as a, or this sort of topic in panels, is think about what happened here. For the first time in history, a game mechanic, not the gambling side of it, because this is even banning it in games that don't have any prizes at all except, you know, gifts in a game. They have banned a specific game mechanic because they feel that it has a detrimental effect on society. That would be like if we banned platformers. <laughs> Just, you cannot make platformers in our country. So, uh, enforcement in Japan is a complicated thing. <laughs> And the law isn't just like ban, you can't use the mechanic, it's some complicated mess. But they, they did pass a law that is like, you know, you cannot do this thing. You know, the law says kampu gacha in it. You know, it's hard to read, it's in another language. Chris, like, so, so as, a, as uh, you know, on the development side of things, you know, hearing about this kind of thing, the, the problems that it causes, uh, what do you think about, you know, would you say, oh, well, I should use this because it's this super thing that people get really crazy into, or are you like, okay, I see the problems it's caused, and so I don't feel comfortable, I wouldn't feel comfortable using this mechanic. I mean, I, this might, this is probably not something that comes up in your work a lot, but, but just kind of, uh, I would be interested to know what your perspective on that is. So, so my philosophy and, and what we do in my company is if we're making a consumer game, which uh, we've only done one of before, and we'll probably do another one probably later this year, um, we, we just make the game the way we want it. We make the game for gamers. <coughs> However... On the other hand, when I make serious games, games to teach people things in the military uh, or businesses or things like that, there's a specific goal. And there's a specific set of goals in mind that we want to achieve. We want people to think this way strategically. We want them to think about um, the implications of their decisions, the long 
term effects of all the decisions that they make. Um, let's see, what, what variables are sensitive and what things they need to really pay attention to. So we're focusing on those things, so it's not so much uh, are there eth ethical considerations there, they're all, meta they're all defined in our requirements, in what, the, in what our customer wants in their game in the first place. So I think in that regard we don't have, um, uh, we're meeting our requirements as opposed to making those sort of decisions. Hmm. Hmm. So another very big topic on video games in particular. Wow, that projector is way dim. Oh, wow, I didn't realize. It's like Doom 3. <laughs> <laughs> it is Doom. So, I mean, it's a picture of Doom 2. But anyone have a flashlight? <laughs> we, we could adjust those lights, but it's not worth I need to mod my uh, clicker. Wait. <laughs> so <coughs> there are studies now that are starting to show that while there is no real link between video games, at least no causal link that we can find between video games and actual violence, there are increasing number of links between violent video games and desensitization to violence, meaning not reacting to it in the same way that you would if you hadn't played these games. And it might appear, I'm being very cagey because these studies are relatively recent, I haven't read them fully, <laughs> it, and I also don't have access to all the journals they're in yet, is that it might, have a, it might be a different or more profound effect than other media such as ultra-violent movies, like the torture porn, Ichi the Killer cinema that's very popular lately among this very same demographic. Mm -hmm. I will let our slides be. They're not very important slides. <laughs> so is there, is there an ethical consideration? Do we care if the games we're making are objectively desensitizing people to violence, or is that even a problem in the first place? Well, let's, let's jump back historically. The Colosseum. Okay. Mm -hmm. The Colosseum uh, was That would be a great game if we brought it out today. <laughs> Whoa, why? Oh, there is. It's called uh, Swords and Sandals. It was very, very successful, and even after the rise of Christianity, uh, in the Roman Empire, the Colosseum <coughs> still lasted an additional 300 years and only stopped because they ran out of money. They, uh, they made one, spe I think one species Sounds like of the NHL. Of <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was just all of this, this raw brutality. But people, the philosophy was, well, we'll leave it all there in the Colosseum and then people won't be violent elsewhere. And that was, that's how they, they believed it. Um, so the question is, is, or one of the questions is, is are video games any worse or any better than that? Well, let's fast forward to much later than Rome. It was within a hundred years of our current time in a lot of parts of the world, uh, even though two, three hundred years, the late Middle Ages, the early Renaissance, and then onward through the Industrial Age, violence on streets, for example, uh, killing cats, torturing cats, was a hobby in parts of Britain. You would set a cat's tail on fire or put a cat in a bag and set the bag on fire. Yeah, it's and look, there's whole Wikipedia articles about this as a hobby young kids would perform. I mean, it's only relatively recently that we've outlawed things like cockfighting, dogfighting, you know, all bear these baits. horrible things. Yep, yeah. bear baiting or public hangings. I mean, a hundred years ago, kids would go watch a public hanging and then go home and play games with their little brother. And they'd laugh and scream and jump around while the guy's legs were kicking and talk about the, you know, the death jig he was doing or whatever. You know, so, at least anecdotally, you know, about myself, I can, you know, I've played as many violent games as, as anyone, you know, and it's sort of weird, I find, is that, you know, I can watch the most violent movie or play the most violent game and not even care, but if there's, like, real violence, not even, like, big violence, like, someone cut their finger open pretty bad, it's like, I want to barf, <laughs> right? See, and that's so weird because I'm the opposite. I have no problem with those kinds of situations in real life, but I cannot, I do not play any kind of realistic war game or I don't even like watching things like Saving Private Ryan, right? Yeah, those, I, those things affect See, I can me. watch Saving Private Ryan, but <laughs> I, can't, I can't watch a doctor doing a surgery on TV. Oh, see, that's, like, not so a big like, oh. deal. So between the two of you, what about the situation of if we have a video and you don't know if it's from a movie, a game, or or it's real video, like you can't tell. How do you there's, react there's to some, it? I think there's something in my brain, like I think I can tell at least. There right? was a video that, that uh, was believed to have killed some model, uh, some number of years ago. I'm trying to remember what that name of that movie was from the 1980s. It was a really, really big controversial yeah. movie. You mean and, a stuff film in uh, Maybe. <laughs> Um, but anyway, there was, there was a big controversy because they tried to stage it such that the model actually died to make it as much like a snuff film as they could, but really she didn't, and it was all fake. And they actually went to trial about that. Yeah, and the model had to appear to prove that she had right, so. killed. Well, I think there's an ethical consideration if we actually kill one of our players in the course of a game. That would be a problem. The DDR yeah. machine has a spike that comes out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what, this gets to the same question of, you know, uh, you know simu packages. 3D simulated child pornography, right? Is that, well, that's, no one's getting hurt there, but we still, that's, you know, I think most of us would agree that that's still not... Uh, I would argue that it's bad, but from a free speech perspective, it has to be allowed. Because in my opinion, free speech really is defined by the most abhorrent speech you tolerate existing while simultaneously condemning. But you have to allow people to express it. I don't think we do, so. 
Uh, the U.S. does. It's US? not illegal. It's not? Okay. And uh, speaking of death in video games, there have been a few, a few, more than a few players who have died playing StarCraft. That oh, is actually... true. They just played so long, yeah. So at what point... Whose concern is that? Is that the video game designer? Is it the person who runs the video game uh, boutique where the guy sat there and played for 50 hours? Is it the person who sold him the energy drinks he used to keep himself going? Is it uh, the healthcare system of the country he lived in? Is it himself? Period. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it's it, when it's a combi- when when something bad is caused by a combination of many things. You know, everyone always likes to lay blame at least on someone, right? But like, how do you blame multiple people simultaneously, and how do you figure out which which party is w- to blame for which part? So how much blame each gets? But video games are really easy to blame, so we we, yeah. we end up taking a lot of it. And especially <laughs> people like to blame, you know, especially a game because it's not a person, right? Because if you blame a person, that person can fight back against you. Whereas if you blame an object, you know. And then and this is something interesting too. If you look at movies, everybody here can almost everybody can probably name several directors that they know the movies of. And if you go if you go to the public, same thing. However, how many people in the public can name the designers of their favorite video games? Very, very few. I mean, in here, yes, in, in MacFest, yes, but in the general public, if you say who is who is Miyamoto, um, I would I don't know what. Twenty percent of Americans might have heard of Dude, we we lecture. I think that's probably pretty generous. generous. Yeah. You know, an anime convention, most people can't even name anime, let alone directors of anime. <laughs> yeah, they'd be like, today the best anime is Homestuck. It's like, all right, kids. <laughs> <laughs> now, I would make an argument that desensitization to violence, as long as there isn't an actual correlation to causing further violence, might be a good thing, because it allows people. In my, this is just my unexpert opinion. It allows people who are subject to an immediate act of violence or witnessing something horrific to be able to keep a cool head during it because they're able to suppress their emotions temporarily. Conversely, if, if anyone's seen any real fights, most movies and video games do not portray that accurately at all. Yeah, that, I mean, I tried to run as fast <laughs> as that Counter-Strike guy does, and yeah, I don't make it across dust. I mean, but here's then the other, the, the flip side of that is that, you know, you've got things like uh, America's Army and, you know, maybe some of the types of things, I don't know what, what Chris works on in his top secret uh, projects. <laughs> for the government, but uh, you know, you have these games that are designed to desensitize people to violence and get them into this, and then so they are can go and kill people. Um, and so, uh, you know, and that all of that is you know, evolutions of, of games that have come before it. Um, you know, I don't even know. So, this is a tricky one. <coughs> Suppose you know, we torture Sims, we destroy civilizations. At what point does AI become advanced enough to where there is any ethical concern at all? At what point, if a sim passes the Turing test, is it ethical to murder them? <laughs> oh, who knows what the Turing test is here, by the way? Most people. Okay, so just the, for those of you who don't, it is um, uh, Alan Turing, a very fam- famous computer scientist, came up with and said, how do we know if, if, a, uh, if, if an artificial intelligence is human-like? So he said, if we put it behind a... a put it behind a wall, and put a human behind a wall, and we can communicate only via text, can a person reliably tell that this is the machine and this is the person asking whatever they want, communicating with whatever they want? Is it a good test? There's lots of papers arguing that it's, it's a bad test for various reasons, but it's... It also depends on the person on the other side. Right. Know, the real person could it's be really... The ground. Yeah. Although we, we are getting to the point where, where it's, it's getting hard to tell. Uh, they, you know, they, do it, they, have, they have AIs that, that succeed more than 50% of the time in convincing someone that they're human. Um, yeah, mean, it's even like, talking with Cleverbot nowadays is, can be, can be <laughs> kind of interesting. <laughs> So, <laughs> so, so what defines us, as, you know, we call ourselves sentient, we believe ourselves to have some sort of advantage upon other, you know, we, we, we draw this line between the torturing and killing of a sentient being versus the torturing and killing of a tree. So what exactly is the line? Are we defined by our genetics, by the complexity of our interactions? Are, what defines sentience, and at what point can we create sentience and then have ethical considerations around it? A few more data points is an ant. Is it ethical to torture an ant? Is it ethical to torture somebody who's brain dead? Those sort of things, I mean, most people would probably say, say no for the latter. Ants, some people would probably say yes, some people would say, would say no. But where does AI fall among those? The ant one's a good point. I would argue we already have some AI that are more complex than an ant's nervous system. They have more complex behaviors. And would you feel bad about torturing an ant? Well, I mean, you know, it also depends a lot on the... Some people out the, there are like, nah. Right. But then a few of you are like, oh, that poor ant. Well, I mean, we can know that someone who does torture an ant, right? So it's like, is torturing the ant in and of itself, you know, necessarily wrong? But we do know that someone who enjoys torturing ants is probably someone who's going to grow up to be a serial killer. Watch out for that guy, right? So, well, has anyone on this panel and ever enjoyed torturing a sim? A sim? A sim? I, love, I mean, I, I, I definitely, I mean, not, not, not in sims, like, I totally, I mean, I play, uh, I've been playing Skyrim lately, finally. 
And uh, one of my favorite things to do is to go, oh, hang on, quick save. Actually, in the face. Oh, and now let's load the game so that didn't happen. You know, um, whenever someone pisses me off. I did the same thing in Deus Ex, Human Revolution. I was, I was sick one day, so I played the whole game through in like two days. And every time someone was annoying, I would save the game. I would murder them and everyone around them. And then I just reset the game and continue. And I get frustrated that you can't kill children in Skyrim. Mm. Wait, so... Although there's a mod for that, apparently. So think about that. Wait, so what defines our intelligence? Is it our memories? So if I torture you to death, and then I'm able to undo that entirely with science and remove the memory, so that it, as far as you are concerned, it never happened, is there any ethical concern around that? Uh, or what about the drugs that block memories from being formed? So when they do brain surgery, a lot of times they need you to be awake. So they'll give you a drug that doesn't, I mean, uh. they'll give you local anesthesia, but it will just prevent you from <coughs> remembering the surgery afterward. I, but just, you I still just read an article about people who wake up during surgery, and I was like, yeah. uh... But no, my grandmother went through that too, the twilight uh, anesthesia and all that. You are conscious and able to act, and you're fully aware the entire time, but you just don't remember anything that happens to you. So it's as though it didn't happen, but there was a thread of your consciousness that did experience it at one point. So at what point is something experiential, if you experience it or if you remember it? I mean, this is, so, I mean, so, I mean, you can take away surgery and maybe uh, an example that's more familiar to people in Macbeth. Uh, so what if you torture someone who is blackout drunk? Um, you know, they're not going to remember either, but I, I think that we would all agree that that's, you know, certainly not acceptable behavior. So, um, so should we not save our game, murder all those people, and then on? <laughs> well, I, no, because those people are real. Well, so it, it, you know, <laughs> what, if, what if they are blackout drunk, but your torture does not permanently, you know, do anything to them, right? I mean, you, you know, if, if you in real, if, if you so did torture someone. about taunting people, I mean, at that point, right? Is that? Mm. The trouble is it's, it's harder to reset the real world, I think, for now. Yeah, at least. I just I wonder at what point we're going to worry about this because all of us torture our Sims. We destroy our Sim I cities. Don't. Well, you've never played The Sims. I did. I played The Sims, but I have this weird thing when I play video games. It's like even ones that are like like uh, Knights of the Old Republic. You're you know, it's like I'm gonna try to be the dark side. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it, guys. And then I go in. And it's like you're on this quest, and it's like, well, there's really only one way to go on this quest, and it's totally good. And I end up just doing good things all the time, and I never do the bad things. I don't know why. <laughs> Even when I'm trying to do the bad things, I just can't do the bad things. <laughs> well, I think that, that also goes to the, you know, the whole good versus evil debate, or if uh, most people who are evil are trying to do good. A lot of people who we perceive as evil think in their own mind, given their own biases and beliefs, which are often erroneous, that they are trying to do good. So augmentation, this is an issue for video games. It's not just an issue for you know, sports or anything, but sports are also games. We've got several lines of augmentation. We've got things like steroids, uh, performance-enhancing drugs. Uh, in the game, like video games, transcranial stimulation is shown to increase performance in many mental tasks. That's where you put a certain voltage sort of current pulsing across your brain. And people are already working on trying to come up with ways to do this at home. Especially pros who win tournaments and make lots of money. And of course, you know, this example, a handicapped person was able to perform effectively as well as a non-handicapped person with an augmentation. Are there any ethical considerations about this in gaming, in video games, in sports, in anything? Well, I mean, there's the, there's the, you know, the ethics of winning and losing at sports, especially something like boxing, where there's money on the line and the winning and the losing, right? So you just sort of have, you know, Pete Rose betting on is the game that he was playing in, you know, all those sorts of things, which, you know, have already been pretty much well uh, examined by society. I mean, I think it gets into, you know, the issues of, like, cheating, yeah. um, you know. If, if I can write a bot that can play better than me and I have my bot play, is that ethical of me? If I wrote the bot myself. If well, I had I'm, the same problem in math class when I was a kid. You know, if I can program my calculator to do things for me. I mean, I programmed it, obviously. Me too. Yeah, it. Me why, too. Can't, why can't my calculator do the differentials for me? If I cut off my perfectly functioning legs and replace them with four pegs that I can play DDR with perfectly, <laughs> is there an ethical consideration of letting me do that? Yeah, is he allowed, Nominally, I'm is he allowed to win the DDR tournament or is he not allowed to play, you know, does he not count? Is or he, even, am I even league? allowed to? Nominally, I mean, I have the agency to decide to do that, but what if the DDR tournament, the, the DDR tournament circuit is huge cash prizes? Maybe I don't actually have as much agency as I think because I, as a player, for example, need that money. <laughs> Yeah, and is it right for say what if what if he lost his legs legitimately and has awesome peg legs? Is the DDR tournament allowed <laughs> to keep him out? You know, it's like if he did it on purpose versus whether he just you know stepped on a landmine, right? Is the DDR tournament people you know still allowed to say no? You're not allowed in here. But then how do you how do you measure purpose or intent? That that always comes back to one of the yep. core questions of ethics is usually it's very difficult or impossible to do so. 
And for example, in sports, I mean, some people argue we should just let people who wish to, you know, have a separate room <coughs> for robots and steroids and everything. But then there's the ethical concern of much like the gladiatorial arenas. You're basically letting a class of people choose to destroy themselves for the purposes of your game. And also, I mean, I think there's definitely the factor of, of whether or not that's explicitly allowed or disallowed. You know, um, so, you know, if you're using you know, macro programs and things. I play really old school games, so I have no idea what, what people are doing nowadays to cheat in, in like modern <laughs> video games. We use like, you know, like bots to cut wood for us because we're lazy and things <laughs> like that. You know, is there a difference between, oh, I've, I, you know, wrote this and no one's ever disallowed this before, uh, and so it's, it's allowed. Uh, but then the same thing, they say, oh no, you're not allowed to do that. Um, you know, how, where does that change? Was it okay before and now it's not because it's banned or was it not really, allowed, not really okay, okay for acceptable behavior in the first place? Well, here's a, player, here's a player ethical concession. In Quake 1, there were offhand grenades. You could be shooting and hit a button and a grenade just pops out. In While Quake, you're shooting, like... In Quake 2, that did not exist. I spent a long time writing a small script, which was perfectly allowed within the game, because you could like buy, you could write macros and bind them to keys that would switch weapons, throw a grenade, and switch back Perfectly. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't some program outside of Quake, right? It was in the Quake console. You you know bind you know this letter. You know this. Wait, 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 wait. Throw a grenade. Wait, 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 wait. Shoot. Wait, right. You know. So would it make anyone uncomfortable if they knew I was doing that and you were playing against me and you did not do that? I guess not. I'll continue to do that if anyone wants to play <laughs> Quake Two with me. <laughs> I mean, you know, the way I've always seen you know cheating is that you know every any game, whether it's video game, board game, sport, whatever, right, has rules. You know, and some, something like a sport, there's a rule book. It's usually gigantic, right? And it's basically if you do something that is you know contrary to the rules in the book, that's cheating, right? Board game, you have a rule book, right? When you have a video game, the questions get vague because no, people don't write rule books these days. They just have source code, and the source code is the rule book, right? And you don't get to see it necessarily most of the time. So it's, you know, the way I see it is you're cheating if you do something that, you know, you're, you're not running the same code as the other people. You've modified the code in some way. What if I'm well, running... That there's bugs, too. So, for example, let's say you're playing a board game, and all of a sudden you arrive at a state, like, I have three of this and five of that, and now what do I do? And the, the rule designer forgot to put that in the, in the, in the game. You're like, okay, what do we, we have to come up with something, right? Well, in a video game, uh, there are defaults, really. Whether or not the, the designer put it in there intentionally or not, there's something that happens or doesn't happen. It could be the game crashes, or it can mean you fall through a wall and lose a life. It can mean all sorts of things. So if you're exploiting it, really you're being like that person who follows the letter of the law, but not the, the meaning of it. Well, I, I, you know, if it's a video game and they didn't print a rule book that says otherwise, I have to assume that whatever the game is doing is correct, even if you know the designer messed up, right? Mario Kart, they have drifting, right? And it's like obvious, yeah, they didn't expect people to go like this, right, to win because that makes a really dumb game. We know that. It Unfortunately, there are people like me who are perfectly willing to do that to win every game, right? And it's like there's nothing you can do about it. At the same time, in a, in a lot of situations, especially interactive online games. <laughs> That the source code is not the, the end all be all law because you've got the EULA that you agree to that can say, if we decide that we don't like what you're doing, we can kick you out. Mm -hmm. um, and so you really become subject to the ethical, the ethical decisions and, and about what's allowed and what's not allowed really come from that, that agreement that you, you know, you're eventually saying, I give you the power to make all these decisions and, and yeah. really do whatever you want. See, but that's, one of those agreements, they're really scary. Yeah, see, that's, uh, well, I mean, that's, that's even trickier, right? Because, you know, in the NFL or something, you'd have a referee. But you know what the referee's rules are. You know what he's going by. <laughs> Whereas with the EULA, it's just, I'm allowing administrator of MMO to make these decisions. And he can decide to kick me out of the game at any time for any reason. And it's like, you're playing a game and you don't even know all the rules. Someone could just make up rules suddenly. It's like, there's Calvin Ball, but that guy's in charge. Although there are pretty, right? good, there are pretty good guidelines. There I mean, are, there like, are very I, good I guidelines, like obviously. I would be hard-pressed to be playing World of Warcraft and be like, oh, I didn't know that was not okay. Why would you ban me Right, from that? yeah. Now, on the no. flip side, as the, the person who runs the game, now we're talking about fairness. So if somebody, uh, are we talking about case law where this person did X, and got banned. Now, if another person does X, but let's say they did it inadvertently, or there's some special case, is that a special case, or is it because that person did X, they get banned? Is that well, a new rule? For example, say you've made an MMO, and there's, you know, you're trying to detect bots that are farming wood from something. So what if there are a large number of players, and let's, let's make this an extra juicy example. So they're severely autistic, they have some sort of mental disorder, but they can play this game. They enjoy this game, but the way they interact with the game is indistinguishable from a bot. They just because love the harvesting they wood, harvest just like the their wood. favorite thing in the world. Just harvesting wood like crazy, and it looks like bots. And then they, there's all these bots who are harvesting wood, too. So they're just in there with the bots, all harvesting the same forest. Well, I, I once got banned from uh, Wolfram's math re resources because <laughs> I opened about 20 tabs, 
and thought I was a bot. So I got banned. My, my penis got banned. I've actually, I've actually literally been in this exact situation where I was really kind of on a um, wood cutting kick. And, um, in the game I was playing, what happened was uh, one of the administrators whispered me and say, uh, you need to respond to this in 60 seconds and tell me you're not a bot. And if you don't, you're going to be banned. And I was like, oh, no, I'm not a bot. I swear I'm just really doing a lot of wood right now. Or you're just doing it by hand, like, you know. I was just doing it by hand because yeah. I'm really a goody-goody. Yeah. I've been playing the same game for 14 years, so I don't really take chances with the rules. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> now, another thing that, so, for example, what I like to do sometimes is people don't like to play Scrabble against me. And the reason is because I usually don't agree to a dictionary beforehand. And then I'll let to. people... No, well, I, I, then you don't play with me. So uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna. Um, so, so then people, uh, I'll, I'll let them have a word that's sort of on the edge or something like that, and then I'll put something really absurd, and they'll go, that's not a word, then okay. So I'll put down something less absurd, less absurd, and finally they get tired of me, so they'll, they let me have something. And so it becomes this game, I turn into a game of negotiation, which is more fun for me as a game theorist. Uh, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I don't wanna play negotiating. See, I don't play Scrabble online because I cheat. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so. You so just play letterpress instead, letterpress. The, 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 urge, the urge to use those, those machines that tell you what to do uh, is so overwhelming. Uh, that I just don't play. I just don't play. But is that is that cheating? Online. Is that cheating? I mean, um, I think so. It, knowing that my my sister uh, had this problem where uh, she was playing words with friends and, and she was using these these things, not all the time, but pretty regularly, and uh, was really good. And her friends were always like, "Wow, you're really good at, at Scrabble. You know, you always win." And then one day she was uh, hanging out with a couple of her words with friends buddies in real life, and they said, "Oh, hey." Let's play Scrabble. Um, and about halfway through the game, they were like, you're terrible at this game. And then it, they, the light came on. And they were like, oh, you cheat. And they were really pissed off and did not talk to her for weeks. <laughs> so I think that people would definitely consider that cheating. I mean, people uh, consider it cheating, but I mean, if is you it and cheating? I say, if you and I say, let's, let's do whatever we want, no holds bars. But I think a lot of this, you know, these kinds of agreements in, in games especially comes down to what we have agreed on beforehand mm -hmm. and what the, the consequences are, the stakes. You know, that I think there's a, it's, a lot of these decisions are much more tricky when there are prizes on the line when there's, yeah. uh, you know, consequences. Of course, if you and I are playing a friendly game of poker, um, you know, if I'm cheating, the only thing that I'm really losing is, is you know, uh, a, a friend, probably. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, I'm not causing you any kind of financial loss, and I, I think they're a little bit... Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to agree on everything beforehand because there's always certain house rules. Because some people won't agree on dictionaries. Right. Or, or <laughs> a, you know, if you play pool from somebody else from a different region in the U.S., you might all assume, okay, we, we agreed, this, this is, these are the rules we're going to go by. But there's something in the back of your mind or that you're not thinking about that, oh, you, you, you can't do that. Yeah, I can. Yeah, Monopoly is a great example of this. Right. No one plays Monopoly with the actual rules. Or Nobody the does. Um, they should. I bet you know knows the actual half. rules. <laughs> you know? right? It's almost a good game, though, if you play with the real rules. Almost. If anyone wants to play Monopoly, good, I'll though. be around later, because I'll <laughs> your ass. Well, I mean, there was, you know, the, the only thing that comes to mind is this year in the NFL, if anyone is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers decided that they were going to start rushing on the kneel down, right? It's like usually at the end of a football game, when the time is out, you, you know, your team is winning, you have the ball, you just want to run the clock out. You just kneel down, and the game is over. And everyone just sort of goes, all right, you, you win. Tampa Bay was like, basically, it's like, it's the kneel down. There's no way they can win, but they're going to rush anyway and knock you over, and someone could get hurt because the other team is expecting just, you know. Okay. And it's not against the rules, though, but everyone got really pissed off, and it was like, screw you, well, Tampa. What the, the idea hell of soap breaking social conventions. Right. right. The guy yeah. I used to, to work with at Motorola was, uh, he played football in college, and they had a, you know, football has all these trick plays that are very rare. And they had one guy who just had an arm on him, so they would set up like they're going to, to kick a punt. And the guy would go back and do a pass to the guy who was uh, receiving. And he'd fair catch it. They'd get it all so that the guy was all ready. Fair catch. He'd catch it and he'd get creamed because it, it was a pass. It was, and it was an interception. It was not a kick. Mm -hmm. So those sort of things are, can really blindside you in, in games as well. Yeah. All right. Let's move on. So in terms of the industry, there are many concerns here. I don't know if we really want to talk about the sort of the deep end of the industry, but the fact that in general, people who make video games on the programming technical level compared to the same qualifications in other industries, make piddly money and work ridiculous hours. I can attest to that. <laughs> so what do we do about that? Are the, is there an ethical problem with playing games that you know as a player were made in what amount to the first world like white collar equivalent of a sweatshop? Right, it's like if you won't buy a t-shirt that was made in some country, you know, in a, with really bad working conditions and child slave labor or something, right? Are you gonna buy a video game that was made by you know, ex-company employees that were forced to work 90-hour weeks with testers that got paid, you know, barely minimum wage? Well, or even or a company that just has bad business practices in terms of refunds or putting out games that aren't, you know, fully featured the way they were advertised. Um, oh, oh you know, funny, uh, funny that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
So it, especially regarding these guys, I don't know how many, you can read the whole saga of this. I don't want to say anything, especially because I'm I not. I think they've since had to change the name as well because that was also, I, we're going to yeah. talk about yeah. that too. I'll, I'll avoid a deep discussion of this because I don't want to get into a libel situation because lawsuits are flying, possibly. <laughs> but no one sued the maker of a movie for false advertising because the trailer was better than the movie itself. Yet, in a video game, suddenly that's effectively what happened, but yet gamers have a different expectation. So yeah, I mean, people use, you know, bull shots all the time in trailers, and no one's ever gotten in trouble for it, right? It's just you might get bad press if, you know, from certain outlets that will care about it, but... Well, I think this was more than just having a trailer. It was, but this was. Well, this, this particular was example We have was. these features, and, you know, we're not in, you know, all these things, and then just didn't deliver the content that they promised. Yeah. It's like if someone said, here, I'm going to give you this gallon of milk, and then you open the gallon of milk, and there's only three, you know, a quarter of a gallon in it. You're like, well... That's not what you promised me. Well, I think that's, you know, a movie, you know, I mean, what if I advertise my movie as knows. being in, you know, 3D and it wasn't 3D, right? It's, it's a specific, measurable, quantifiable characteristic of your product as opposed to the more ephemeral characteristic. Yeah. The greatest blockbuster of the summer. Yeah, it's like, you know, sure, it is to me. Who are you to tell me I'm wrong? But, you know, it's ten minutes long. Actually, it's five minutes long. Yeah. Well, there, how about the more interesting one? In, in gaming, like in game design, I mean... People who make games and talk about games often share a lot of information that is effectively private. And we know, you know, it's not it's not like formal signed non-disclosure agreements, <laughs> but we all kind of agree, like, hey, this is the game I'm working on. Hey, this is the idea I have. Pax Dev even is totally open. I mean, p people talk about inside baseball at Pax Dev, but you can't talk about it outside of Pax Dev. If you do, you're banned from Pax for life. All Paxes. So there aren't actually really ways to copyright game mechanics on a fundamental level. You have to go really roundabout ways with process patents, which are difficult to get in games, mm -hmm. or around the intellectual property itself, like the actual rule book, the rules as you wrote them, the art assets. But game mechanics, by and large, are not copyrightable. Yeah, if I made a time-traveling RTS that was mechanically identical to Akron, but was fantasy-themed and had wizards and whatever, you couldn't really do anything about it, right? We have a patent on that. Oh, do you? Yes. Uh, you're the only one, right? <laughs> but I mean, most people, right, it's like Settlers of Catan, right? I could go make Settlers, you know, a, a space settlers of Catan, not call it Settlers, not call it Catan, call it something completely different, completely different theme. Settlers of Bataan. No, it had to be a little more different than that, right? But it would still be a game with hexes, and you roll the dice, and you, you know, they, it would totally work. So the difference between a, a, so like a process patent versus a game, so mm. game mechanics are not protectable by themselves, just like in, a, a fashion is not protectable at mm. all. However, if there's some specific technology and some specific mm -hmm. innovation that is required to achieve that, uh, that game mechanic, then it is patentable. And there are some patents out there, I'm not going to say any, anything, but um, there that are on that fringe of really, is that really a technological innovation to pull off <laughs> that game mechanic? Go search out there for patents. There's some, interest, there's some interesting edge cases. There. Well, I mean, the last patent I got, I got it back when I worked at IBM. It's this like 40 page patent, it's a process patent that basically boils down to a Python script that does one thing. Something that. Uh, something on a computer. On a computer connected to a network. Yeah, it's something that anyone who you know had that job and had that task would could come up with on their own in ten minutes without knowing about this patent whatsoever. Right. But luckily, the but game only someone who can hire a lawyer and pay them two hundred fifty thousand dollars can get a patent on it. The only reason I have that patent is because an army of IBM lawyers got it for me. I didn't do anything except say this is ridiculous, <laughs> <laughs> and then sign the paper because I had to. <laughs> well, you could have quit. I, I don't have enough agency to quit my job. At least I didn't back then. <laughs> Not that, but I just said you could have. I still had student loans back you then. You had the power to do so. So how much can you borrow from someone's game idea before you're stealing from them? As a game designer. We've all seen clone games. And um, you know, going back to what we were talking about before about the... the the industry of people not making much money, and people complain, oh, this game is $2.99, I, that, let me go play the free, free one, it's not quite as good. But <laughs> I, I, I sometimes say that freemium is, is the reality TV of gaming. It's bringing that price down, it's bringing the quality down too, but that's what everyone's doing, so you have to compete on that. So. That's a very apt analogy, because you know, the reason there's so much reality TV these days is very simple. It costs almost nothing to produce. Right. You, some people don't realize is that when you, you make, sell one ad, right. profit. When you make a sitcom, you have to pay the writers who are in the writers' guild. You have to pay actors in the actors' guild. You have to pay you know all these people who are union labor. A lot of them, and it's very expensive. In addition to building sets and all the other things that do to produce a TV show, when you do reality TV, you just use sets usually just outside, right? It, it's the same structure as a game show. You pay the host. You don't have to pay anyone in the writers' guild anything because it's not written. It's edited. 
You know, and it's it's the 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 budget for a reality show, even a really big one, is way way lower than you know the Simpsons or four or cameras, any, bunch of lavalier you know, microphones, or anything. Yeah, bunch of people with drama. Follow them around for a month. You've got enough footage to make a whole season. Yeah, and you just have camera guys walking around. It's 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 very inexpensive. So <laughs> uh, that's why real, how reality TV uh, gets made. Or you as a player, is it ethical for you? Uh, look, talk about price discovery in games. Deus Ex was what, like 50, 60 bucks when it came out? Uh, I really wanted to play it. I waited a couple months. I bought it for twelve dollars. I mean, or I mean, how many how many people have pirated a game? I mean, on ever. <laughs> Right. I mean, uh, you know, and I mean, and it's giving. You know, there's lots of. You know, it's, it's. You know, it's easier if you want to do it. I mean, on Android, it's ridiculously easy. If I want to go get a game for free, I can. Um, I, I choose not to for some reason. Probably because they're so cheap. You know, I, nine nine cents. I, I maybe I don't have fifty dollars to fork out for some fancy console game. I, I feel like I pretty much always have a dollar nine nine. If to I spend know. more than that on breakfast, right? So well, yeah. especially here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. So it's, it's doing this this interesting bifurcation of the game industry where you have these AAA titles where oh this game this, the graphics are okay I want this game which has awesome graphics and they spend fifty million dollars in the development alone of the game and on top of one hundred and fifty million dollars marketing so you have this gulf where they have these really low end freemium games and then you have these big high end games but there's no room for anybody <coughs> in the middle and we we experienced this with Acron a bit because we were you know we were sort of a mid budget game and there's there's nothing there so we were being compared to StarCraft two with its massive budget and I sometimes say that our game was made in the Probably a, a comparable budget to what StarCraft spent on accounting, and but at the same time we were bigger. You know, we have like you know forty hours of gameplay, all sorts of rich features. So we're not one of those freemium games, and that market I feel is is really drying up. Well, it's also complicated by the fact that you know the, the, I talk about this a lot lately. The all media, like a game that comes out today, is competing with every video game that's ever been made in the history of mankind, except for the few that were lost. And every book, and every movie, and every everything. So even piracy, I don't think, is a factor anymore. I think it's really just that people aren't willing to pay, and they'll just wait. They'll wait till the company goes out of business, and then pirate the game when they basically can, because maybe no one owns the assets anymore. So if pir if waiting and not and buying old games for cheap hurts the industry and hurts game makers just as much as piracy, do you, as a player, have an ethical concern that's different for waiting versus pirating? Forget the law, but think about your own personal ethics. And there's price discrimination as well. So let's say that, um, let's, say, let's say for physical, yeah, quant physical things, let's say the Xbox. You remember uh, when the Xbox 360 came out or when the PlayStation 3, there's all these, these things on eBay you can buy for $2,000 because all these stores are out of stock. Well, um, so there's this thing called price discrimination. So let's say there's somebody out there who's really rich, money's no object, oh, they'll pay a million dollars for the Xbox 360 because it doesn't matter. If Tribes 2, 2 came out, not Tribes 3, but Tribes 2, 2, I would pay... Pretty much everything in my checking account for right now. Yeah. Right. So, so you have those people, a few people who pay a lot, and then you see, work your way down the price, and then there's a whole bunch of people. Let's say everybody in the world would pay one penny for the Xbox. Maybe that's something like that. You know, okay, I'll take it. Um, but Might as well. <laughs> um, what, where do you, as, a, as, a, as the seller, put that price? You try, you, people want fairness, and if you charge somebody more than somebody else, like Amazon does sometimes, people get all up in arms about it. But if you set a certain price, then you're saying, here's the part of the market that I'm going to have. I'm going to have no more, no less. And you can decrease the price and try to get more of that tail of people who are willing to wait. But it's a very complicated problem. So food for thought, if I'm a game designer, it's a freemium game, and I profile my players using the data gathering we talked about before, and then I figure out who is that different type of player, and they see their own prices, and the game's set up to where it's not easy for them to share the prices they're getting with other people because I obscure it through layers of virtual currency that have hard currency on the end, that feels really unethical, but is it? Well, it reminds me of, uh, has anyone seen Iron Monkey, the, uh, the more recent version, right? So there's a scene where uh, the Iron Monkey, he's a doctor, by the way, a Chinese doctor with fake medicine, and he's sitting there, he's got two patients, and one patient is like this old, homeless, old guy, and the other patient is like this rich <laughs> brothel owner, right? And he's, he's, he's checking them out both at the same time with his kung fu medicine. Uh, and he says, oh, and he realizes they both have the same illness. It's some STD or something. So he writes the same prescription simultaneously with both hands with his kung fu skills, right? And he gives them both to one guy, right? And then the rich, you know, he tells the rich guy, oh, yeah, it's 10 tiles, which is gold pieces, right? And the poor guy's like, oh, my God, I don't have that much money. He's like, no, yours is free. And the rich guy's like... What, what do you mean he has to pay nothing and, and I have to pay 10? That's ridiculous, right? He's getting all pissed off that it's not fair. And then Iron Monkey says, what, you can't afford it? Right? 
Yeah, and the guy, and then the brothel owner's like, oh, pay him, uh, right? And it's like, well, yeah, maybe you can charge different people amount, different amounts of money for the same thing, and it's fair. Maybe. And then we start getting into the, the classical ethical discussions. If there's a doctor and there's some, some stranger who's traveling to his town, think back in the Wild West, and the doctor can kill this person and take all the organs and save 20 people in his town that he knows personally. Does he kill the stranger and do that, or doesn't he? Or the, the fat man question, if there's a train... Or kill him, let him die. Yeah. Like the, well, but is there a the, difference between the two? Is there, yeah. There's a tram speeding toward five school children who can't get out of the way. You're standing on top of a bridge. There's a fat gentleman standing there. You could shove him off the bridge. He would stop the train. One would die. Five would be saved. Is it ethical to push the fat man? <laughs> that was fast. Oh. Well, or even, you know, the train is just going towards the I kids. Mean, You're standing there. There's a lever. If you pull the lever, they'll be saved, right? If you don't pull the lever, are you a murderer? You didn't start the train running. You weren't riding the train. You didn't put the kids there. It's just you had the ability to save them. They're going to go you find a fat man. To. You have them play a puzzle game so they don't think about the social considerations. And then they, they optimize. Sorry, I, do, I want to take a couple of questions to be able to, you know, wrap this up because we're starting to run out of time. So bathroom. one last question. We talked about Ender's Game. So my question to you is this. Is it really unethical to do what they did in Ender's Game? If the person playing the game doesn't know and a net good happens, is it bad that I'm playing my Xbox, but really I'm piloting a drone off in space killing people? <laughs> is, if it's unethical, why? Alright, so we're gonna do Q&A, but you have to obey Scott's... We, can, we have two minutes. Yeah, you have to obey Scott's <laughs> rules of Q&A. Here's the rules of Q&A. You must ask an actual question. You must make it one or two sentences. It has to be on topic. It has to be relevant to everyone in the room. No questions about just you. You can't promote your own stuff. And if it breaks any of these rules, I'm just gonna cut you off and go to the next person. Alright? Okay. Let's try to go right across. Left. Rapid fire. Let's do this. Okay, so uh, you were talking about pricing games when they're being sold, people waiting and uh, not wanting to pay for it. What if it were set up like the movie industry where you have something uh, where they ha play the movie in theaters and then it goes to DVD? The people who want to see a media. All right, you've gone more than two sentences, but, but we get the idea. On live. Yeah. It, it, I think it's the same question, the same ethical consideration, in my opinion. All right, next. Uh, yeah, pretty much every question you asked about ethics, you said, well, is it ethical to do this or is it ethical to do that? Don't those all really just boil down to utilitarianism versus categorical imperative? Basically, yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Welcome to ethics. Chris. Is whichever one you believe in. Do you so agree my with Milton, or do you agree with Ken? So my answer to you is simply that in the video game industry, almost no one talks about ethics at all. Right. right. The, the problem you, is that we are not having these, these discussions are not really happening on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, you know, they happen in ethics classes maybe yeah. once in a while. Well, but, but they also, in other industries, you know, if you go into accounting or finance, there are ethical people on the staff in the companies, even though they might be corrupt or evil anyway, right? But there are people discussing these things, like, is it okay to do this thing with our real estate company? But in video game companies, in board game companies, you know, no one's thinking about, you know, are the things we are doing ethical, right? Zynga just does what or it does they without are, caring. Or even studying these things, um, yeah. you know, well, what we don't... The question being asked in, the, in, in all industries, like at, wherever they are being discussed, wouldn't the same answer is applied to just to them then? So does it matter if they're not talking about it, if they know the answer from somewhere else? Well, because apparently everyone's going to make their own decisions, but if, if no one even has the open discussion, then, you know, things that are possibly dangerous, like very addictive games, start becoming increasingly a problem. And it's also different for serious games when, you when you're teaching people about life and death situations. Is a, is a game that teaches a surgeon how to operate in a specific environment that teaches them incorrectly, now you start getting into very important... And look at sports. Even in, in the U.S., in government, we have not had a serious discussion about the, the possible argument that maybe we should allow crazy augmentation in a separate league in sports. Because yeah. You may agree or disagree with it, but we're not having that discussion. We're having a much narrower discussion in our just general Most discourse. ethics discussions revolve around the business decisions made by the company and not necessarily the ethics of the product design, which in video games is more important than, or in games anywhere, is more important than, say, if you're designing... You know, pencils, I right? You can't, you know, the design of the pencil can't be unethical. Let's squeeze in one more question. You in the red? A lot of these questions seem to boil down to human psychology. Do you believe there's room for psychological degree in game development? I do. I don't think you make any money in it, but I think it's a very important question. <laughs> <laughs> Thing is, you won't make any money if you're an expert game designer or programmer, let alone a psychologist. <laughs> Well, actually, I take that back. I do know a couple psychologists, PhD-level psychologists, who do make a living doing this sort of stuff. But it's a very tight and small market. We have some video game psychologists right here. I'm going to 
call you praise um, visiting. Um, so pe people definitely do do it. Um, there's definitely room. there's room for everything in video, video games. You know, coming from a very multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary kind of stuff where I have been studying video games, um, people do it in all sorts. We've got sociologists, anthropologists, political scientists, um, you know, ethicists, philosophers. Um, it's a very multi uh, multidisciplinary kind of site of study. So I think we have to get out of the room, and we have to get to another panel in panel four in a half hour. <laughs> so thank you all. I hope this was enjoyable. Make ethical decisions in your gaming. Thank you.